Hey Maniacs, welcome to B-Movie Mania Interviews. I'm Paul Brooks and I'm chatting today with filmmaker Mark Pirro. Mark has been writing and directing low-budget movies for honestly as long as I've been alive, 40 years now. Pretty amazing stuff. Uh, He's made movies like Death Row Game Show, A Polish Vampire in Burbank, and Nudist Colony of the Dead. Really fun stuff. We sat down to talk about all those movies and much, much more. So let's get into it. Here's my interview with Mark Pirro. It's B-Movie Mania. Mania. Mark, welcome to B-Movie Mania. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, For our listeners out there who might not be familiar with your work, talk a little bit about uh, what you do and uh, what you've been doing as a filmmaker. Okay, well, let's see. What do I do? Uh, Well, I've been making low-budget, ultra-low-budget movies for many years, probably three or four decades now. I think I I, I did my first feature film in 1983, which was uh, Polish Vampire in Burbank, which we shot for $2,500. And uh, fast forward to today, I'm still making movies for $2,500 or less. The only difference is now is that they're better focused and there's a better exposure. And the technology just makes them look a lot more polished than what we did way back when. But uh, that's pretty much my thing. I just make these movies, uh, you know, every few years we'll do one. And uh, hopefully each one gets some recognition. Some do, some don't. But that's pretty much that. So you mentioned your first film, Polish Vampire in in Burbank. What was it that initially got you into the into the idea of becoming a filmmaker? You you moved out here in the seventies, if I'm not mistaken. What what was the initial spark that that sort of got you interested in the process? Uh, well, I, I always liked films. Uh, when I was a kid, I'd go to movies once a week or more. Um, if I really liked the movie, I would literally go again and again and again. I think the record is uh, one of the James Bond movies. I used to be a Bond fan, and I think I saw Diamonds Are Forever like 26 times Whoa. in a theater. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I really loved filmmaking and, I mean, film watching. And then that kind of segued into filmmaking. I got a Super 8 camera when I was a kid, uh, about 13, and I would get classmates and friends and we'd start making our little movies. And uh, they were short films, but they were pretty much assembled the way movies are done. We shot out a sequence. We would shoot, uh, you know, where whatever we could do to tell the story. And I'd edit it together with little scotch tape. And, uh, and then when I moved out here... Um, basically I came out to California with the goal of getting into the film industry on some capacity. Um, but I, I became a tour guide at Universal Studios and I discovered that movies were made kind of the same way I was making them when I was 13, out of sequence and shooting in, you know, two or three locations, wherever we had access, that sort of thing. So, um, so that was pretty much it. I just, once I, I got the job at Universal and was able to kind of look, uh, hang around sets and, and basically watch filmmaking being done, it just got me more and more interested. And if I'm not mistaken, you did the typical thing when you moved out here where you didn't have any contacts, you didn't really have any people that you knew, you just kind of put everything in your car and headed out here? Well, no, I, I flew out here with about $300 in my pocket, but I, I had a sister that lived in, uh, I guess it was Culver City at the time. So I stayed with her for about a month or so just to get settled. And then I got a small apartment. It was a $75 a month apartment in Hollywood. Um, and then just started to send out letters. And of course, when you come from, uh, I came from upstate New York, and when you move out here, it's a big culture shock. It's like uh, you come out here and realize that you're one of 100,000 people that are trying to do the same thing, and nobody really wants to talk to you about your little Super 8 movies or whatever. So when I, after working at Universal, and I realized things weren't really happening, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get another camera and start making films again. So I got a bunch of friends together that worked with me at Universal. Uh, In this case, they were actually, a lot of them were trying to become actors, so it was great to get them involved. 
and then we'd start making uh, you know I, I made a, a 20 minute film and then I made uh, like a 45 minute film Super 8 and then um, and then ultimately said you know what let's try and make a feature and same thing gathered a bunch of friends together and it took a long time to do but that was kind of how it all came about cool we should mention really quick that we're by the airport right now so okay. if you hear anything in the any rumbling in the background no big deal <laughs> That's my plain impression. <laughs> the Van Nuys Airport, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was watching your film, Nudist Colony of the Dead, recently. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. I really enjoyed it. And there's some pretty absurd stuff throughout the entire film. There's lots of nudity, of course. <laughs> uh, there's musical numbers. There's rapping. There's zombies. I'm curious how the actors in the film handled it. Was was it a fun experience making that one? Uh, well, that particular film, not so much. Uh, only because uh, we were using really inferior equipment, and we would uh, we'd struggle to get exposures. Uh, I mean. I, I put a joke at the beginning of the film where it says the audience is squinting uh, because it really is probably one of the least visually pleasing of my library of films. But, you know, I mean, we had good times here and there and, you know, and it was a fun movie to try and put together. But I I really look back at that movie and go, I would I would love to remake it and do it with real singers and real dancers and real cameras and the whole thing. I mean, I know it's got a little bit of a following and that's always fine, but um, I, I, I cringe when I when I look at the film because there's so it's just so badly shot, you know, and I that's the to me that takes away from anything else. Uh, I know the songs are cute and you know it's got a bubbly uh, soundtrack and the whole bit, but when I look at something that's that's that poorly executed and I even tried to remaster it at one point I tried to go back and fix things because today's technology allows you to do that but you can only polish a turd so much so <laughs> so uh, yeah that would, like of all the films I've done that's probably my most cringeworthy one as far as visually but of course as a filmmaker you're always going to be more critical of your own work than than you know an audience watching it um, I found that you know a lot of the old school aesthetic is part of the charm, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it has a certain quality to it that a lot of movies that come out today obviously don't have. So I guess it just depends on, on your perspective. Yeah. And I, I don't have a problem with the oldness of a movie like Polish vampire, which was shot a few years before nudist colony of the dead looks so much better just because we had better super eight equipment to work with. And I had a, a, you know, my DP, Craig Bassick, who worked on Polish Vampire, we took more time and care with that film than we did with Nudist Colony of the Dead because that was kind of like co-sponsored by other people and we didn't have all the time we needed to get it right. So, gotcha. um, But yeah, I'm okay with, with older looking films. It's just that when it's blurry or when it's, uh, you know, underexposed, that's kind of where I have an issue. Got it. Um, I asked my fellow co-hosts of B-Movie Mania if they had any questions for you, and they did, so I want to get to a few of those right now. Uh, Jason wants to know if you think Tom Hanks ever saw your film Buford's Beach Buddies. (laughs) Well, funny you mention that because there was a uh, current affair show, you know, the show, the news show. And they did a segment on Jim Hanks, and uh, they said, and you could find this online, by the way, this uh, this segment for a Current Affair. They said that Tom based the character of Forrest Gump on the character that Jim played in Buford's Beach Bunnies. Oh wow! Because in Buford's Beach Bunnies, he was kind of this simple-minded character, and uh, I don't know if there's, I, mean, I don't know if the similarity is because Tom Hanks saw it or just because they come from the same gene pool. But, uh, if you see that interview, you'll see that there was some critic or some character that said, yeah, he was sure that Tom Hanks had seen the film. And we should, I guess we should mention Tom's brother, Jim Hanks is right. the star of the film. Right. And at the time, Jim looked a lot like Tom. So, uh, in fact, it, it was sort of a, a point of, uh, struggle with Jim because every time we would be shooting in a public area, he would disappear because he said that anytime he's around a camera, a movie camera, 
people think he's Tom. And I think for a while he resented that. Mm. I think he got over it now, but at the time he, he really had a problem with it. Mm. In fact, when we did the interview, um, uh, I mean, when I did the, uh, the audition, he did not tell me that he was Tom Hanks' brother, nor did he use the name Hanks. Really? He came in under an assumed name, a different name, because he didn't want that to influence my decision. And all throughout the interview, I was saying, God, you look so much like Tom Hanks. You should get a job as his lookalike or whatever, which he <laughs> smiled politely and accepted. But then after he left the audition, I was told by the casting director that was Tom Hanks' brother. And I'm going, oh, Christ. <laughs> and that did influence my decision yeah. a little bit. So there you go. Uh, Mike, my, my co-host Mike, wants to know uh, if there's any of your films that you would like to remake today. You touched on this mm -hmm. with Nudist Colony of the Dead. Any of your other films that you look back and say, hey, I'd like to take another shot at that one? Yeah, you know, any of the early films that were shot on Super 8, I would love to see redone. Um, not so much by me. Like, I always thought Tim Burton would be great if he were to take on Polish Vampire or Curse of the Queer Wolf and do it with his slant. I'd have no problem with that. Can you imagine a, a CGI computer-generated uh, skeleton from Polish Vampire? But, uh, yeah, Nudist Colony of the Dead is one that I would really love to redo, but not on a low budget, because you, I really want singers that sing and dancers that rehearse and... You know, and maybe the makeup, instead of using makeup, maybe we could do a CGI thing with motion cra uh, motion control like uh, like the Planet of the Apes movies are doing or what have you. So, uh, but yeah, anything prior to uh, Death Row Game Show or even Colorblinded, anything prior to that that's Super 8, I would say would be ripe to be redone. Death Row Game Show, by the way, um, was put out on Blu-ray not too long ago. Um, I can't remember the company who did it. Are you? Yeah, it's Vinegar Syndrome. Vinegar Syndrome did it, yeah. They put out a lot of great stuff. Are you involved in that process when they decide that they want to take an older film and, and re-release it on Blu-ray? I was. Um, in fact, see, I don't control Death Row Game Show. That's controlled by Crown International Pictures, the company that financed the movie. But um, And they had put out terrible versions prior to this. I mean, I'd seen it on... When it came out on VHS, the speed was wrong. It ran like, uh, you know, several frames faster than it was supposed to. And when it came out on Laserdisc, same thing. Then it came out I, I, a couple of times on DVD, terrible copies. Vinegar Syndrome, which goes right back to as close to the original negative that they can get, they contacted me and said, do you have any supplemental material that we could do for this DVD? Um, and I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have a documentary on the making of it, um, which I put together. Uh, we agreed to do a commentary track for it. So I got together with two of the actors, John McCafferty and Robin Blythe, and we did a commentary for it. And then I gave them two of my early Super 8 short films, uh, The Spy Who Did It Better, which was a James Bond parody that starred John McCafferty, the star of Death Row Game Show. And a short film called Buns, which is about a hamburger killer, a guy that kills people that eat hamburgers, which that one ran 20 minutes or 20, 22 minutes. And that was one of the first movies I did when I you know, started making Super 8 movies again out here. So, And then I, I think I did a couple of um, video introductions for them. We really loaded up the DVD. And although, again, I don't control the movie, but I did control a lot of the uh, supplemental stuff that went on. And I was happy to do it. It was nice to get a, a finally a decent version, which, by the way, in addition to the original version of the film, they also included my remastered version because I, I remastered Death Row Game Show several years later, um, adding things, fixing things that I never liked from the original version. So I would have preferred that had been the only version that was out there, but they decided to put both of them on the discs. Well, I'm definitely going to go have to pick that up now. I'm a big fan of supplemental material, and when you have a disc that's loaded with bonus content, and I'm a fan of the movie, too, so I'm definitely going to have to pick that one up from oh, right. Vinegar Syndrome. Um, one more question from my co-host, Jason. He wants to know, what's the first step in learning how to masturbate very quietly? There's a question I wasn't expecting today. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear for our listeners Apparently, that was something that was listed on your LinkedIn profile. Oh, really? 
I don't get to LinkedIn all that much. See, anymore. I knew I shouldn't have put this in here because it was going to be very strange if you didn't remember writing that on your, on yeah, your LinkedIn. Yeah, I, I don't know what kind of... Something uh, about you having a, a, several college roommates when you were in college. Um, I, Jeez, yeah, that doesn't sound like anything that I wrote, but I, you never know. I mean, <laughs> I, I think I did write on LinkedIn when I was using it under... Um, special skills or whatever i think i put yeah. the ultimate sex machine or something yeah, yeah, crazy yeah. like that but but yeah i don't use linkedin anymore i mean i i you know i get emails all the time and i just don't get in there that much so whatever's in there was probably in my juvenile uh adolescent kind of days <laughs> paul cut that part out maybe <laughs> there you go <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, we're all about B movies here on this podcast. That's the name of the show. What are some of your personal favorite cult films, or you know, smaller budget films, uh, other than obviously the ones that that, that you've done? Yeah, um, you know, oddly enough, I have a f- lot of friends that make cult movies and low budget films, and uh, like I have a friend in uh, New York named Paul Scrabo who did a movie called Doctor Horror's Erotic House of Idiots. Nice, and uh, I think that's a cute little film. It actually starred a couple of people from my films too, Conrad Brooks, who oh, was yeah. also in Plan Nine. He was in three of my movies, and uh, uh, Michael Thomas, who. I had seen in this movie, um, he does a great Bela Lugosi impression. And I saw clips from Paul's film when he was making it. And I saw him doing this great Bela Lugosi impression. And I said, would he be willing to be in one of my films? And he said, ask him. And he was. So I ended up using him in Rectuma, playing this Bela Lugosi character. That's great. But anyway, I got off the track here. So there's that film... um, I I I kind of followed um, uh, Ray Dennis Steckler's films, um, the incredibly strange creatures that stopped living and became mixed up zombies. Mm-hmm. That is such a weird film, but I can watch it over and over again. Um, what else did he do that was kind of interesting? The um, Wild Guitar, uh, Ega with Richard Keel. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are movies that I wouldn't invite friends over to watch unless they're as weird as I am because we do. I have friends over and, and we do movie nights because I have this huge screen in my living room. It's like a movie theater, and we'll pull movies out all the time. But I kind of shield them from some of these crazier titles, yeah. so so I don't really bother with those. But um, <laughs> anyway, I, I'm trying to remember if there's any other ones. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a fan of the old Ed Wood films. In fact, I knew about Ed Wood before anybody else knew who Ed Wood was. Really? Because I used to watch Plan 9 from Outer Space on at 2 in the morning. It used to play locally on television here. Really? And I would watch this thing going like, this is so terrible. But somebody made it. Somebody nurtured it. Somebody loved it. I don't get it. So you have to go to the library back then. There was no internet when this thing was happening. And... I did a little research and found out this filmmaker, Ed Wood Jr., and he had, uh, I guess he died about, uh, oh, maybe a year or so after I discovered, or no, before I discovered who he was. Ed died in, I believe, December of 78. Uh, That sounds about right, yeah. And so then people started to find out about him. They had festivals, the Golden Turkey Awards festivals, and uh, there's a theater in West L.A. called the New Art and they had an Ed Wood Film Festival, so I went with a bunch of friends. Yeah. And in the back row, there were a lot of these actors from Plan 9 sitting there. Uh, Conrad Brooks, uh, uh, Paul Marco, uh, uh, Gregory Walcott, I want to say. People that were still alive and, and involved in that. And as we were walking out of the theater, they were walking out too, talking about how much fun it was. And, and that's when I struck up a conversation with Conrad Brooks and said, you know, I'm starting a movie myself. That was Polish Vampire. Would you be interested in doing a cameo on it? And he said, I haven't acted since the Ed Wood days. I'd love to. Really? And put him in the film. And uh, we, we stayed friends for years. And he just died very recently. Yeah, very but, recently. Uh, but it was, I thought, how cool is this? I've got an Ed Wood actor in my film. I ended up using him in two other films of mine. Um, but there was sort of this link to the past there. Yeah. And, and there's, there's something to be said for that because I, uh, always feel a sort of a, when I meet some old time actor from an old film or television show, I always feel like a, a weird connection to the past. And, um, 
when that happens, it kind of makes me feel almost, um, you know, goosebumpy. Yeah, know? sure. I mean, I, some people may feel this way. Others might not even know what the hell I'm talking about. But um, yeah, that was that was kind of cool. And uh, and then Conrad ended up moving away, so I haven't yeah. used him in years. Well, yeah, I think he moved back to the East Coast because I, I have to pick your brain about this a little bit more because I'm sure. a huge fan of his stuff. He did a lot of movies in the 90s, right? Uh, early 2000s, I believe, as well. Uh, Roller Gator and things like that. And I'm just a huge fan. So what was he like working with and, and getting a chance to hang out with him and things like that? Um, very, very sweet guy. Um, never delivered the line correctly, um, <laughs> nor did he remember the lines. Um, many times he'd have to be fed lines. In fact, he worked on my friend Paul's film, uh, The uh, Dr. Horror's Erotic House of Idiots. He was in that one, too. Yeah, he he really wanted to be there. He wanted to be involved in these projects. And the biggest kick, I would imagine, of his life is when Tim Burton made the movie Ed Wood sure. and put him in it. You know, Conrad has a cameo in that film. I don't know if I ever caught that. It's uh, There's a scene where Johnny Depp goes into a bar. Yeah. And the bartender says, can I get you anything else, kid? That's, yeah, that's Conrad. Got it. I'm going to have to go back and... Watch that. That's uh, Bordner's in Hollywood, I believe. Uh, yeah, I don't know if they really shot it there or if that was a set, but that's, um, yeah, that was the scene. And when he, the movie came out, he would see it. He would go see it dozens of times. And uh, he used to talk about how the guy who played him, uh, the, there's an actor that portrays Conrad in the movie. Yeah. Uh, he, he mentioned some of the things were not entirely accurate. Like he said, Bella Lugosi never swore at least on the sets. Um, and there were a few other inaccuracies, I guess, but the movie really wasn't a documentary. But that created a whole new surge of interest in the character, in, in the act, I mean, in the, the, the filmmaker, Ed Wood. And by proxy, it made Conrad a bigger celebrity in a way. He would do a lot of these autograph shows. Mm -hmm. and he would go all over the country doing these things until, um, you know, until he died. Yeah. So, but yeah, he was, a, he was really a fun person. When we did... Um, Curse of the Queer Wolf, he could not loop the lines. We, we had to do a lot of looping in that film because the cameras were so noisy, so we had to replace the dialogue. He could not get the hang of it, so I ended up looping his voice in that film. So it's my voice coming out of Conrad's uh, <laughs> body, which is kind of a sexual thing. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that's great. And it's nice to, to hear you say that you know he, he found some success later on in, in his life from Tim Burton's film coming out, and he got to travel around a little bit. That's great to hear. Yeah, he. Um, when I met him at the, at the back of the New Art Theater, he had not acted since the days of Ed Wood. I mean, he more or less gave it up because there was really no interest in Ed Wood uh, prior to that. And then when I put him in Polish Vampire, um, he st I don't even know if it happened right away because he was in Polish Vampire, Curse of the Queer Wolf, and Death Row Game Show. And he, um, I don't even think his renaissance happened until after Death Row Game Show. I think then people started uh, pulling, you know, contacting him and putting him in projects. And then he ended up doing like hundreds of these yeah. little low budget projects. And literally, if somebody said, I got an iPhone, I want to make a camera, can you do it? Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> I always called everybody kid. I'll be there, kid. <laughs> that's so, great. Yeah. Oh, that's really great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about filmmaking. You know, you mentioned you're, you're still making movies today. And obviously the technology has improved vastly from when you first started. Um, but what, what would your advice be for other independent filmmakers out there who are trying to make a, trying to make a smaller film, trying to market a smaller film? Um, and also, what are your thoughts on self-distribution these days? It's a completely different ballgame. It, well, it is. I mean, it's always been hard to sell a film. You know, it's 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 easier to make a film than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we started doing it, you really did have to put a little bit of a cash outlay just for film stock and processing. Well, that's eliminated now. Right. So, and your cameras are so much cheaper, and the quality is just so much better now. So, um, I, I talk at colleges once in a while, and I always say that there's um, no budget is no longer an excuse. 
Okay, so you go out and you do it, but I would also suggest that you don't give up your day job. I mean, shoot on weekends, shoot on evenings, and, and it may take a while. I mean, it may take months and months and months, you know, to, to finish your project or at least to get the shooting part out of the way. But, you know, have your regular source of income so that you can go out and make your money and then set aside one or two days a week to do your shooting. Get actors that you can rely on. Um, in the early days of filmmaking, there would always be a flake. Uh, there would always be at least one or two actors that would flake out on me. Uh, my first film, Eddie Deason, was the star of the movie and then decided to quit while we were shooting it. So that took a major rewrite, and then I ended up starring in the movie because of that. Oh, wow. Um, I had a couple of actors over the years do the same thing. Now, most of the time, they weren't the stars of the film, but they, you know, there'd, there'd be an actor that just wouldn't be available or they'd get bored with the project or all that. So uh, that hasn't happened quite so much in the later years of my filmmaking because I've really honed in on getting them on board from sure. the beginning. Yeah. You know, and you sit there and you tell them at the beginning of the film, we will work around your schedule. We won't ask you to give up any paying gigs for this. We'll always make sure that, you know, that everything is cool as far as your, your schedule goes. In fact, my uh, two films ago, I did a movie called Rage of Innocence, and the lead actress got The Hunger Games. She got a part in The Hunger Games. Oh, wow. And while we were making the movie. And I thought, oh, my God, well, she's not coming back. <laughs> well, she did. You know, so it, it, it really pays to get people that you know are going to be cool and devoted. And sometimes, sometimes it's hard to tell in the beginning, which is why a lot of times I'll use the same actors over and over again because I know they're reliable. Now, the second part of your question is distribution. Well, um, that's a double-edged sword because you want your movie out there. You can put it on YouTube. You know, it's out there. People can see it. Uh, you going to make money off of it? Probably not. Right. But um, if you're fortunate enough to get it into some of the mainstream, uh, you know, streaming video, I mean, streaming websites like Netflix or iTunes, or I forget, there's so many of them now. Amazon Prime. Uh, yeah, Amazon Prime, Amazon Instant. There's so many different ways. And again, you may not make a lot of money off of these because now you're relying on clicks. How many people are going to watch your movie? Um, are they going to watch it all the way through? Sometimes you get paid by per minute watched. Mm -hmm. So don't even think of doing this to make money, at least right at this stage of the game. Now, if you're fortunate enough to make a movie that happens to click and find an audience... Great, you know, that's the icing on the cake, but that should not be, at least from where I stand, it shouldn't be your motivating factor. Your motivating factor should be to want to express yourself, make a movie, you know, do something artistic. Um, when I would talk at schools, the question that comes up a lot is, why do you do this if you're never guaranteed to make money? Why, why do you even bother doing this? And my stock response has always been, well, do you like sex? Do you get paid every time you have sex? <laughs> no. Why do you do it? Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, and if you do get paid, that's a whole other profession, I suppose. But uh, but if you really enjoy doing something, then money is not, I mean, it's a reward, sure, but that's not the reason you do it. Right. And so there's your long-winded answer. No, I, I agree 100%. Um, well, I know you have some projects coming up. Anything that you would like to mention? Um, well, nothing solid at the moment. I mean, we are toying with the concept of doing a remake of Nudist Colony of the Dead. Um, but again, the only way to do that in this case is I wouldn't want it to be a real low budget film mm -hmm. because I really would want to have, you know, motion control and I'd rather have, uh, you know, dancers that can dance and singers that can sing. And, and for that, you need rehearsals and you're not going to get people to do that for free. So... That's kind of toying in the back of my mind. I also, I've been doing some stuff with uh, the comedian Judy Tenuta. Uh, we've done a series of short web cast videos called The World Accordion to Judy. And um, she actually did a small part in my last film, Celluloid Soul. So she has a project, a feature film that she wants to do. And right now that's sort of in limbo. So I'm not even going to say if that's going to happen or not. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, so we're always just juggling around things. Sure. And hopefully something will come about. Cool. Great. Um, lastly, if people listening right now would like to keep up with your projects, keep up with you, where can they go? Uh, social media or anything like that to keep up with your career? Um, well, they can go directly to my website, which is pyromount.com, P 
P-I-R-R-O-M-O-U-N-T dot com. Uh, that's pretty much where I keep everything up to date. Uh, I have a Facebook account as well. Who doesn't, right? Uh, I don't know if I do enough on that, though. I mean, I, I will post things occasionally, but most of the time it's me condemning Trump or, you know, doing <laughs> doing some other crap like that. So I, I don't know if I really post enough of my filmmaking stuff on Facebook. But, uh, but yeah, Pyramid is that I also have a website called the submissive jesus.com which is uh, because i created a toy uh, back in 2009 for a movie i did called the god complex and in the god complex at the end of the movie god and jesus walk amongst us but they are incognito so they work at a toy manufacturing place uh, called aspro and what they do is they invent this toy, which is a little bust of Jesus's head that will answer your prayers when you twist the crown of thorns on his head. It forces him to respond. Anyway, we did this for the movie. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to try and market this toy. So we made 2,000 or 2,500 of them. And, uh, you know, we sell them here and there. I sold about 800 so far. But you can go to thesubmissivejesus.com, see the toy in action, and you can actually buy the toy. Cool. Yeah. And, of course, we will have links to Mark's website and uh, links to thesubmissivejesus.com mm-hmm. uh, on the website below under the interview. Mark, thank you so much for chatting with me. It's really been a pleasure, and I have to tell you, I'm a little bit jealous getting to hear some of your stories of hanging out with the old Playing <laughs> 9 crew and everything. It's really cool, so I, I very much appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Listen up, maniacs. Do you have a question or a comment? Would you like to uh, send some bourbon to Uncle Lloydy? You can contact the gang on Facebook at B-Movie Mania. You can also drop them a line at bmoviemania.com. Reach out. Touch them. They are touching themselves. And they might just reach back. I'm Lloyd Kaufman saying, see you next time on B-Movie Mania. Woohoo!